Yes, good morning, everyone. This is uh, Sunday, January 17th, 2021. My name is Malik Ishmael, host of the Vanguard Show on podcast. My co-host Kathy is away right now, uh, out shopping, out and about, so uh, she'll be on the next uh, episode. But I have a very special guest in the building today, uh, someone that has been a mentor to me, that has uh, been my chairman, that taught me, he pretty much put the pen in my hand. That's how uh, I became a writer, uh, with, with no uh, accreditation, that's for sure. <laughs> but uh, I have B. Kwaku Duren uh, interviewed today, and uh, he's a former coordinator of the Southern California chapter of the Black Panther Party from 1977 through 1982. He's also the former chairman of the New Panther Vanguard Movement, formerly the New African American Vanguard Movement from 1994 to around 2002, but Kwaku will definitely correct me if I'm wrong on that one. <laughs> uh, he's right. also, all right, okay, good, good. I got that one right. Uh, lawyer, he's a political, uh, been a political candidate, uh, co-founder of CAPA, which is a coalition against police abuse. Also founder, I believe, uh, co-founder or founder of Community Services Unlimited. Founder, right? It was a, it was a joint effort, brother. Oh, oh, uh, Boko, effort. brother Boko, who passed. Yeah, brother Sharif, who passed. Yeah. Uh, so it was certainly a, a joint effort. Joint effort, okay, of uh, Community Services Unlimited, and uh, Quaku is here to talk about his history. Uh, the legacy, actually, of the uh, L.A. Panther movement with uh, El Prentice Butchie Carter uh you know to uh from what 68 until around uh, the early 70s and then uh Kwaku reorganized the southern california chapter uh, around 1977 maybe late latter 76 and uh, he's here to talk about that as well as the uh the formation of the new path of vanguard movement which i was an honored member honored to be uh working with him uh then I've never worked so hard in my life and got so much out of it. Uh, so I really appreciate uh, Kwaku and uh, all he's done. And uh, first of all, how are you and your family uh, during this time, brother? Uh, we're good, brother, and I'm, uh, we're all blessed. Oh, good, good, good. Now, today is uh, January 17th. Uh, it's the uh, anniversary, actually, of the uh, murder of uh, Old Prentice Munchie Carter and Jerome, uh, I should say, John Jerome Huggins. Uh, could you uh, speak to how significant this day is? Well, you know, um, because of the, uh, I guess, the, con the conduct of the government to uh, search and destroy the leadership of the Black Panther Party, uh, most notable was the, uh, you know, the slaying of uh, uh, John and, uh, the uh, murder of Fred Hampton in Chicago, and um, you know, so it was, it was a period of time when the government targeted uh, members of the Black Panther Party in order to try to destroy that movement, uh, which is a very and still remains today a historical, uh, very significant uh, organization that moved to, to educate, to liberate uh, members of the Black community but not exclusively the Black community. In fact, the uh, Black Panther Party in Chicago was the first uh, chapter that uh, embraced the concept of the uh, uh, Rainbow Coalition yes. and the need for uh, coalition work among uh, Puerto Ricans, you know, the Latin community, the Asian community, it was this, you know, which made the party a uh, uh, target. Uh, of course, the government recognized that they were really uh, organizing across color lines and attempting to unite the people. Uh, so you know, that was a historic period in our black history, so to speak. Okay. All right. <clears throat> it shows what, what can be done uh, if there's a desire to do so. Okay. And uh, also, we're, we're going to definitely uh, get more in questions with the uh, movement, uh, you know, the people struggling and what have you. But I need to get your, you know, your opinion of what's going on in the country politically. <laughs> I would love to know your take on it. <laughs> well, the... you know, brother, it's, it's a historic time. Yes. Um, the Trump administration is going to be history in, in a few days. Mm -hmm. um, and the Democratic Party, um, um, which is the vehicle by which most of the uh, people in America who are 
progressive uh, relate to uh, have moved to uh, ascend to uh, uh, positions within Congress that give them the ability uh, to formulate real changes in, uh, in America. So it's a historic period, really. And, uh, what were your thoughts when you saw the January 6th, uh, uh, they call it the Trump insurrection? What were your immediate thoughts? <laughs> that these people are crazy and out of their mind. <laughs> and we told, so, right? uh -huh. <laughs> we told them so, right? We told them so, right? That's right. You know, uh, And everybody, I think, really recognized it, uh, recognized it for what it really was. It was a, 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 a stupid, uh, very... Uh, um, negative kind of uh, uh, meeting of the masses, so to speak, that uh, uh, follow blindly behind uh, uh, President Trump, soon to be ex-President Trump, and probably um, impeached again for the second time for his conduct and lack of real concern for the needs of the masses of people in America. Okay. All right. And, uh, you know, it was Dr. Kato Gato Cooks who described you as a breath, breath of fresh air coming into the party. When, why, and where did you join the Black Panther Party? Uh, well, let me give you the short story. This is long. Okay. Long story. Um, I was organized at the community-based uh, school um, that was modeled after the Black Panther Party School in, in Oakland. Um, we moved to uh, establish relationships with the Black Panther Party, I think it was in 70. Uh, the, I guess the spark for that uh, uh, movement toward the Black Panther Party was the murder of my sister on the highway right outside of Oakland. Um, she was uh, killed by a member of the California Highway Patrol after being stopped. Um, so that led us to uh, develop relations with the uh, Black Panther Party in Oakland because she um, was really a, a notable organizer on her own merits uh, here in, in Southern California. She was the uh, business manager for the community school that we organized uh, and just a very hard, hard, uh, hard, dedicated worker in the community and helped us to establish a presence in Southern California. And after her murder uh, by the California Highway Patrol, we developed uh, our relationships with the uh, Black Panther Party and eventually uh, re uh, got uh, authorization from, um, what's, what's his name? <laughs> Um, Elaine, Brown. Uh, Elaine Brown. Right. Okay. Uh, all right. To reestablish the uh, Southern California chapter of the Black Panther Party. Okay. And I do remember uh, looking at some of the old newspapers where uh, Erica Huggins and and uh, Elaine Brown, who actually led the Black Panther Party at that time, for many of our listeners who may not know that a woman actually led during a certain period of time of the Black Panther Party. Uh, talk about the reopening, which was in and of itself to reorganize the Southern California chapter with the backdrop of history had to be a tremendous challenge. Well, well it was again, because uh, uh, the party was really uh, targeted by the uh, security forces, so to speak, of the United States government. Uh, um, but it was a significant period because we 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 kept the the spirit of the Black Panther Party alive um, and moved to you know, further increase the presence of Black Panther Party in the Southern California community. Um, so it was a historical period that I'm proud to be, to say that I was part of that. Uh, and again, we have uh, deceased members uh, who were part of that effort, uh, Boko uh, Abar and Sharif Abdullah. Uh, Two hardworking, dedicated brothers uh, who are now past, and uh, their memory will be forever 
uh, remember. Um, yes, so um, we, we did what we could during that period of time during the 70s, mid 70s, and, and uh, early 80s. Um, and that struggle still needs to be um, re sparked, so to speak, yes. um, during this period of time. So we can keep the black community and other um, people of color, so to speak, um, apprised of what needs to be done. Okay. Right. Yeah. And also I'd like you to kind of go more into how you met uh, Brother Sharif, uh, who was quite young, I think, when you first met him, and as well as Charles Boko Freeman. Uh, describe when you first met these close comrades of yours. Well, you know, I met, I met um, uh, Sharif, and another brother who now is in prison, um, grassroots brother, mm -hmm. uh, and they came to the school in Long Beach. Mm -hmm. uh, they had heard that we had had some contact with the Black Panther Party, and they were out looking for the Black Panther Party, and they found us in Long Beach. Okay. Um, so uh, that began my personal communications and involvement with uh, uh, Brother Boko and uh, Brother Sharif, uh, who uh, learned about the community school in Long Beach and saw that as a, as a way to begin the Black Panther Party. So um, both of those comrades were, you know, very dedicated, hardworking comrades. Uh, and their presence, you know, is duly uh, missed by me personally. And could you talk about the nonprofit arm of not only the Southern California chapter of the Black Panther Party that you uh, pretty much reorganized, but also the New Panther Vanguard movement, uh, the Community Services Unlimited? How did that come about? Well, you know, Community Services Unlimited was our um, vehicle um, basically for organizing the community school in Long Beach mm -hmm. um, and also as a way to raise funds. Uh, to do the community work that's the heart of any uh, uh, truly uh, revolutionary group. We have to get out into the community and relate to people. And as, as we used to say, is to educate, uh, to liberate, right? Right. So a constant way to, uh, um, you know, involve ourselves in the community, um, develop some, what you call survival programs, mm -hmm. uh, and feed the uh, the children programs, free breakfast programs, uh, all of these programs need to be uh, of, uh, of a threat to the United States government. They felt there was a threat because we were really educating and organizing the people on a grassroots level. Okay. Uh, CSU was our economic arm, so to speak, uh, to allow us to raise resources uh, to continue the organizing in our communities. Um, there's a, there a now famous uh, uh, memo that was put out by uh, the law firm of Mel uh, Melvany and Myers, who uh, uh, basically <clears throat> decided to uh, provide us with attorneys to challenge the LAPD's efforts to interfere with our uh, nonviolent community organizing efforts. Uh, they, they were very much concerned Mm -hmm. And in that memorandum showed that uh, uh, they felt that the reason why we're dangerous is because we're organizing people across ethnic lines and developing what we just call the Rainbow Coalition of uh, people of color coming together to assert uh, some uh, influence on what was happening in our communities and efforts to, to uh, eradicate the most severe uh, conditions that, that the people of color community were experiencing uh, during the uh, mid '70s. Yeah. Okay. And also describe uh, CAPA community. I should say uh, Coalition Against Police Abuse. How did that come about? The CAPA organization. Um. Uh, CAPA was uh, was formed. Uh, mainly because of the LAPD's efforts um, and the influence, negative influence in, in our communities. And again, I uh, can't overemphasize the political uh, 
uh, aspects of the LAPD's organization, um, we eventually uh, uh, got the resources uh, from private uh, law firms and brought a lawsuit against the uh, city of LA because of the conduct of the LAPD. Um, and it was a multi-million dollar uh, mm. lawsuit. Uh, and it really showed what we could do uh, to use the legal system to protect the rights of people to organize. Mm. Um, so it was a historic lawsuit. And, uh, and COPPA really was the centerpiece uh, for that work uh, to challenge the, uh, the negative aspects of policing in, in Southern California. And uh, I know that the, you, there's a uniqueness with the LAPD. I don't know how other communities and cities around the country uh, go. I know they have their uh, issues maybe with police, but uh, LA, the LAPD was very unique in terms of uh, the offensive onslaught, especially to uh, you know activists. Uh, uh, describe even like the 41st and Central uh, attack uh, for the Black Panther office uh, then. Well, that was the original um, uh uh, chapter of the Black Panther Party, and it was a, uh, a classic example of how the police forces were used to interfere and disrupt uh, uh, the efforts of uh, organizations like the Black Panther Party to, to educate and to organize the people in the community. And it was a time when uh, there was this sh uh, shoot in, not shoot out, the shoot in by the LAPD who actually came in to try to destroy uh, the uh, uh, Southern California chapter, original Southern California chapter that was led uh, by um, my comrade. Um, um, Butcher Carter. Uh, Butcher Carter. And the other brothers. John name. Huggins. Uh, John Huggins. John Huggins, right. Right, right. And others, of course, but I mean, Butcher was, was the <laughs> yeah, they were significant organizers, right, and dedicated to the Black Panther Party and its efforts to uh, address the uh, severe economic and political conditions uh, within the minority communities. Um, they eventually <laughs> uh, brought in a tank uh, to yeah. uh, uh, support their efforts to, uh, to murder wow. members of the Black Panther Party. Uh, at the Central Avenue uh, office of the Black Panther Party, the original Southern California chapter. Mm -hmm. um, but the lawsuit was effective to really um, eliminating within the LAPD uh, this unit that was designed solely mm -hmm. to harass and in many cases set up the murder of members of the Black Panther Party. Because the government was very much uh, afraid of the organizing of the, of the Black Panther Party, uh, J. Edgar Hoover, Hoover, the head of the FBI, said that breakfast programs was the most uh, dangerous uh, uh, program of the Black Panther Party because it was put into the minds and hearts of uh, young people uh, a spirit of resistance and the need to uh, organize uh, the community to resist the negative impacts of. Uh, uh, the government's policies locally and, and nationally, and I'll say it internationally. Um, so it was an exciting and a very historic uh, period in the history of, uh, of the African American community and also um, the other minority communities. And the, the memo that uh, O'Melveny and Myers put together clearly showed that the LAPD was mainly concerned with people coming together because right. they knew that people coming together meant the uh, uh, a challenge to, to their uh, ways of policing the community. So it was a very significant historical period that we should not forget. Okay. And also, uh, one of the things that I really um, get benefited by was the people that you would have around us. Uh, you know, the Freeman brothers, Roland and Ronald, yes. they'd always be in the office. Uh, Brother yes. Wayne Farr, uh, Muhammad Mubarak. Uh, how important was it for, for you to connect us uh, as we were working under, under your leadership to the first generation 
and 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 then also Dr. Kato Cooks and and you know people like myself and and uh, you know Heidi and and Dreamer and uh, uh, brother uh, Kwame uh, uh, Kwame as well as uh, Kamal, uh, we all benefited by uh, by you know you having us around those uh, comrades. Yeah, well, this is all. I think it's always important uh, to you know, to acknowledge and to kin continue the, the, the legacy of people who came for us, mm -hmm. right? Because their spirits, even though most have uh, passed, uh, were what was guiding our efforts. It wasn't just something that just popped up during the, during the 70s. It was uh, recognizing the, the work that was done in the 60s and, and in the early 70s um, and the importance of that work. And, the need to remember that and to use that to inspire us to um, continue the struggle, so to speak. Okay. And, and also, uh, I think Los Angeles is quite unique because it had a three era, at least from my viewpoint, a three era Panther movement, you know, from Bunchy's, uh, you know, original Black Panther Party, Southern California chapter, to the time you reorganized the, the uh, Southern California chapter. I think in between you and Bunchy, uh, Geronimo Pratt. Uh, I, I think was uh, uh, toward the latter end of that leadership uh, of the first generation. And then, of course, the third uh, with the new Panther Vanguard movement. Uh, describe the uniqueness of uh, Panther movement, in, in, you know, three era Panther movement in one city. Well, I, th I think that, you know, there was, uh, in fact, as I pointed out before, the efforts of the uh, LAPD, to squash any organizing efforts of the Black Panther Party and the efforts they took to harass us, to jail people, uh, in some cases with uh, um, the comrades who died at uh, UCLA um, with um, a clearly government-inspired assassination effort uh, to limit, cut off the head of the Black Panther Party movement in Southern California. So when we reestablished the Southern California chapter, it was a recognition that we could uh, continue uh, and to rely on the efforts of people who came before uh, in the early organizing of the Black Panther Party to continue that legacy uh, into the late 70s and early 80s. And then how did, how did uh, in terms of the Vanguard, how did the Vanguard movement, uh, you know, from the last time the Black Panther Party was in existence, 82, I guess, when it officially, first of all, how did you find out that it was over in terms of the Black Panther Party? That'd be a, that's a great story, right? There. Well, well, you know, uh, I was in communication with, um, with the uh, members of the Black Panther Party in Oakland, but again, um, the efforts of the government to destroy the party um, was somewhat successful. All right, because the party uh, came to an end for a whole lot of internal reasons and contradictions. Um, but the efforts to reignite that movement with the New Panther Vanguard movement um, was what we felt was necessary. Uh, we wanted to continue uh, the legacy of the Black Panther Party and to try to finish the struggle that they started uh, in the late 60s, and mid 60s. And, um, early 70s. Yeah, I do remember that you were always very, uh, you know, concerned about uh, our rhetoric, you know, in terms of this is not, it's not going to be the rhetoric from, uh, I guess, the, the earlier party or, or the earlier uh, Panthers in terms of maybe a violent rhetoric. Uh, uh, it was more of a focus on the programs and articulation of those programs to the masses. Why was that important? Well, you know, it w we recognized that we could not win, we could start, but could not win a military type style revolution um, in America. It just wasn't going to happen, right? Um, but, but it was important for us to educate people uh, as to what uh, was in their interest politically. Um, and I know on a personal level, I took the position that we had to have an inside, outside, uh, tactic uh, politically um, to support the progressive elements of the Democratic Party. Uh, and that was uh, uh, something that was symbolized by 
the party's political electoral efforts in, in Oakland, where Bobby Seale and Elaine Brown uh, both led a, an effort uh, to use the progressive wing of the Black Panther Party uh, to uh, accomplish uh, the empowering of, of Black people and, and other people of color. Uh, so that was a tactic that we, uh, again, it was an inside outside tactic, work inside the Democratic Party and to uh, also work separately in, in the community to educate people uh, about what was in, truly in their interest uh, in terms of the programmatic uh, uh, efforts to, uh, you know, to challenge the, the adverse conditions that Black people and other people of color were experiencing uh, at that period. And, and describe your own political candidacies, because you've run for a number of things. Uh, describe your political history to people that uh, may not know. Yeah, when we, when we organized the community school in Long Beach, uh, uh, we also launched a campaign uh, for me to run uh, um, uh, in the local in the local community uh, around educational issues. Okay. Um, I also um, the chapter when we reorganized it were uh, efforts to try to uh, use the progressive wing of the Democratic Party to further people in Southern California uh, around issues of national, international concern. Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, also, uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, the time when uh, we'd have these mass food giveaways. I, you know, I always say that a platform without a program is symbol without substance. Uh, there are a lot of groups that were around, but thing is very few really had that relationship that uh, you know, many of the uh, Black Panther chapters had back in the day, as well as the Panther Vanguard. Why was it important to carry this theory into practical application for the community? Well, um, well, well, you know, uh, for one, going we organize these uh, mass gatherings in the community, right? Um, and during those mass gatherings, we uh, raised. Uh, contributions from local businesses, um, even some large uh, local corporate uh, businesses uh, to provide us with the resources to give people uh, bags of groceries um, with an effort to feed the people, so to speak, uh, and, and to um, really let the people know that we were struggling on their behalf. And, those efforts was a way to, to emphasize that we really uh, were, were political uh, organization that uh, was working uh, very honestly and wholeheartedly in the interests of, of the people in the community. And also describe the international aspect of the uh, the Panther movement uh, from the 60s, 70s. You know, you had the British Black Panthers. Then you had obviously what was going on here, Australia, everything. And then even the Panther Vanguard days, we had the group Panther uh, that was involved. Also, Neelam Sharma. Talk about that international connection and also you traveling around the world during that time uh, for these coalitions. Well, you know, I was uh, I was. Um fortunate to, to be part of a delegation of, of, of young people um, who attended the international um, youth camp in Cuba. Mm, yes, um, yes. We were there for, I think, maybe four or five days, I think. Okay. Um, but it was an effort to join with young people um, represented from all parts of the world. In, okay. in Cuba, um, and it was an act of uh, international solidarity of the various uh, groups, uh, many who knew about the history of the Black Panther Party and, and saw it as a uh, example of the kind of organizing that can be done uh, in the name of the Black Panther Party, and in some cases in the name of their own local interests. Um, so, but the spirit the example of the Black Panther Party was followed worldwide. And there were like supporters uh, throughout the world 
right. in various countries, right? Uh, so the party really had an international influence um, in the trip that we took to, to this uh, international youth gathering in Cuba was, was a way to solidify uh, our efforts and to uh, mutually acknowledge the work that was being done uh, again throughout the world uh, because we are dealing with a worldwide power structure, so to speak, uh, that needs to be uh, checks in many in many instances because they often do not really operate in the interest of the, of the people. And I might, might point out later on, you know, we it was a progressive movement for Obama to become president as, as the United States, right? Uh, but there was some, uh, um, no one is perfect, 100% right, right. perfect. But <laughs> I was very uh, uh, disheartened, so to speak, uh, by uh, the existing power structure in America mm -hmm. when the World Conference Against Racism, which is a decade, decades, uh, every 10 years, people right. around the world get together sponsored by the United Nations to talk about ending racism. Mm -hmm. It was a world conference against racism. And I was fortunate, along with other members of, of the Black Panther Party, uh, to go to, uh, uh, to Cuba and to, uh, to participate in this world conference. It was actually wasn't Cuba, it was South, South Africa. Yes, with conference took place, right? right? Um, and the U.S., I learned later, um, even though this was sponsored by the United Nations, I think at that time, maybe 20, 30 years, it had been in existence. But every it was a, a coming together every 10 years of people around the world, particularly people of color, concerned about eliminating racism. So it was a world conference against racism. Uh, and it had been organized every 10 years uh, by the United Nations, but the U.S. under Obama's administration boycotted it. <laughs> oh, well, wow. Yeah. In the 10, but it wouldn't send any official representatives. So we, right. along with other progressive groups in, the, in America, uh, were representing the American people, but the American government didn't support uh, wow. Wow. the against racism because they felt that it had taken a stand that was uh, not in the interest of the political interests of the uh, Jewish people in, in, uh, in Africa, Northern Africa. Okay, all right, all right. Um, but the issue, the issue of, uh, it showed me that uh, even though for the most part, the election of Obama was a progressive movement forward and black people, you know, looked at it and accepted that that it was a progressive movement it wasn't perfect right, right? right, right. um and it did have some some flaws and one of the flaws was from my personal perspective was that it failed to support this effort of people around the world coming together to deal with racism right you would think that a progressive government in america would right. would, would would not boycott you know uh, a coming together of people that happened every 10 years. Right, every right. 10 years, the United Nations sponsored this conference against racism. Uh, and the U.S., from the very beginning, it boycotted this effort of the United Nations to bring people of color together and other people yeah. um, who were concerned about uh, eliminating uh, racism and its effects um, on the lives of of people around the world. Uh, just point that out to show that, you know, it's, uh, there was some defects in, in, in the Obama uh, uh, becoming the first black president, right? There was some right. trade-offs, so to speak. Oh, okay, yeah. Happened. <laughs> Politics. You know, one of the trade-offs was that, you know, the, the, the powers to really be in America say, hey, no, we boycotted this movement for the last 30 years, and we're going to continue to do it even under the Obama administration, right? right. So that became, became the uh, 
official policy of the United States government under Obama is to boycott and to continue the U.S. efforts to boycott this coming together of people worldwide right. to raise the issue of how do we deal with eliminating racism and its in- negative impact on the lives of people of color. So I was somewhat disappointed by okay. that failure to yeah. become, uh, to break that, that chain of non-support of people coming together worldwide to deal with, to discuss and, and develop ways to uh, further our separate struggle around uh, eliminating racism and discrimination in people of color. Okay. And let me get your opinion, uh, and obviously I know it, uh, but uh, talk about the embargo against Cuba that's been since the late 60s, early, or, or I should say uh, early 50s, or uh, late 50s, rather, early uh, 60s, uh, yeah. that's maintained all these years. And how Yeah, well, you is. know, um, mm-hmm. how, how to say it? Well, you know, the, most of the people in the world recognize that the embargo against Cuba was really an effort to squash the revolution, the people's revolution that had occurred with the uh, coming into power of, of um, the forces that represented the people in Cuba, the grassroots people. Right. Um, and um, Fidel and um, uh, Raul. Uh, Huh? Raul, uh... yeah, the, 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 the Castro brothers, so to speak, right, right. along with uh, Che Guevara, who was not a, not a, who was made uh, a, a a citizen of Cuba by a constitutional amendment. Right, <laughs> so to speak. right. They drafted him, made him a citizen of, of Cuba, even though he was originally from Argentina. Right, right. right. Uh, but the embargo was a way to strata. Uh, strangle <clears throat> the evolving people struggle in, in Cuba, right? right. Um, and it was an attempt to, it was a counter revolutionary attempt, right? Okay. The right. Cuban uh, people had been suffering from the, uh, the impacts of the negative involvement of, of, of forces in Cuba, you know, like the mafia, right? Oh, <laughs> you yeah, know, had free run prior to the revolution. Uh, of Cuba, you know, the other business interests uh, were really milking the country Mm -hmm. um, and the people were not progressing. Mm -hmm. But under the uh, Fidel Castro administration, um, a lot of that was changed and programs were developed to really um, empower the people uh, and to bring about changes. In fact, uh, when I was in Cuba, they, they pointed out that the Cubans was about educating and science, right? Mm-hmm. They, they recognized the importance of education. Um, they recognized the importance of a, a good medical system mm-hmm. uh, to, to deal with the uh, medical needs of the Cuban people. So the revolution in Cuba was really a progressive movement and the U.S. painted it as this, you know, nefarious uh, political effort on the part of Fidel Right. Uh, to uh, brutalize the people, but that was that image was was a false image. Mm-hmm. When you went to Cuba and talked to the people in the community. They were very much, uh, very much appreciated the efforts of the of the uh, Castro regime, so to speak, mm-hmm. um, to bring changes uh, to Cuba. Um, they were the revolution in Cuba was concerned about science. Mm-hmm. Was concerned about uh, medical. Providing for the medical needs of people and developing the educational system that has produced probably more doctors than any other country in the world. Like the Cubans uh, provide doctors for uh, countries all over the world, right? That's true. Yeah. South America mm-hmm. uh, and other places where um, medical uh, resources are not, not adequate, so to speak. Um, I hope I answered your question. Oh, you did. You definitely did. You definitely did. And and, and what I wanted to know, also your relationship with Dr. Kato Gato Cooks. I know you had such great relationships, Steve Harris, uh, uh, Brother Day. uh, But describe your relationship with Dr. Kato Gato Cooks. 
Uh, well, you know, Kato was, uh, once we organized the, uh, the, the chapter in, in L.A., he was right there supporting us uh, and recognized the significance of the reorganization of the Black Panther Party. Um, so, you know, and there were, again, you know, unnamed, you know, my uh, former wife, Virginia Harris, yes. uh, was a hard worker, uh, did a lot of work. Um, her brother, Steve, uh, initially did a lot of work. Um, he had his own personal struggles, you right. know. Um, right. But there were, yeah, there were many unnamed um, people who saw the significance of the reopening of the Southern California chapter and did what they could to, to assist us. Um, and and Gato was certainly a supporter of uh, our efforts then and, and our later efforts to uh, build a new Panther Vanguard movement Absolutely. after the destruction of the original Black Panther Party. Okay. Um, yeah, so, you know, there, there are a lot of unsung unknown heroes, so to speak, of that struggle here in Southern California. Absolutely. Uh, but I personally remember and appreciate uh, the efforts of many, many comrades who, who did what they could to support our efforts. Okay. Because um, we could not have survived as long as we survived without that. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. And uh, I've got uh, final three questions I wanted to ask about the proper propaganda uh, uh, of the uh, movement in terms of you know, we're always constantly bombarded by the reactionary propaganda of the uh, mainstream, quote unquote, uh, media. But the Southern California chapter under your leadership had its own newspaper that was actually independent. Talk to, about, about that as well as uh, the New Panther Vanguard uh, version of the Black Panther uh, newspaper. All right. Well, you know, the again, the, the effort was to uh, reestablish the uh, the tradition developed by the original chapter to have its own, say, uh, newspaper and ways of, of uh, educating people about the issues, not only locally, but internationally. Uh, so we uh, did begin to reorganize the production of a Black Panther Party newspaper Mm -hmm. uh, right. And right. put together, I think it was like either seven, six or seven editions. I think I forget exactly the number. Okay. Uh, and we still have copies of those editions available. And we've uh, donated them to several uh, libraries here locally okay. uh, in Los Angeles. So they have in their archives copies of the uh, the newspaper that we put out uh, for about two years, I think. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, so those, you know, we have copies of those still available, um, and uh, if people yes, desire to have copies of it, we can provide them with copies. Uh, okay, I'll give that information part. on how people could do. Uh -huh. uh, provide that information. Uh, how can people, uh, if they wanted to get some of these vintage copies, uh, how would they be? Able to um, well, we're doing it on a first come, first come basis, right? Okay. Uh, but we do have plenty of copies uh, in storage. Um, so they would just kind of give me a call. Okay. Um, my number is 310-786-7639. Give me a call. Okay. Or email me at bequakerdurant at gmail.com. Um, we can make arrangements for people to get copies of those historic newspapers. We have quite a few copies available. Okay. And uh, also, I, I would love uh, at some point uh, to bring the uh, photo exhibit uh, from Old Guard to Vanguard, uh, the untold story of the L.A. Panthers uh, to Los right. Angeles uh, very soon, hopefully, after all this is passed over. Uh, all right. Yeah. But what would your... Uh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just saying, just let me know, brother. We would be very supportive of that effort. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We're going to definitely right. make it happen. And what would all be right. your advice to the today's activists? Well, uh, I would I would say the advice is to do your own research, so to speak. Don't rely on others' uh, research politically. Mm -hmm. Do your own research politically, and to organize, um, you know, wisely, so to speak. You know, uh, we had again this inside-outside tactic that was developed by Black Panther Party in Oakland when Bobby Seals and 
Elaine Brown for office, right? Mm -hmm. And again, these are ways to uh, impact the existing political system okay. uh, and to support those progressive efforts, we'd say, within the Democratic Party mm -hmm. uh, that truly want to work in the interests of the people, right? right. Uh, so it's, it's important to, to be involved politically and electorally mm -hmm. uh, because those are systems that are set up uh, and we have to learn to use them to our advantage. Okay. All right. And uh, one of my final questions is, uh, when are you going to actually uh, pr present your book? Your book? I know I, I talk about it all the time with you. The world wants to know, all the actors I know, they say, when is Quaker going to write a book? I mean, here, I'm a baby. I wrote one. <laughs> and the thing well, is, know, I, I, go ahead, brother. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have the material. I got oh, it. Okay. I have the material, man. I just need to, to, to set it aside for maybe a couple of months. Uh, to, to get it done, right? Okay. Um, but it is on my agenda for this year. Okay. All right. Great. Great. Look All right. Yeah. Uh, so I hope to have it done in, in a little bit this year. Oh. Okay, all right. We're look, we're gonna hold you to that, <laughs> and I'm gonna yeah, keep asking. I, I hope to have it done. I hope to have it done this year. <laughs> well, brother, I really appreciate you uh, speaking with me here on the Vanguard Show, and again, uh, you have been a tremendous inspiration. Uh, I remember uh, Peace Punk. I always say you're one of the heroes, and I and I said the same thing. You're one of the heroes of the the movements in Los Angeles, uh, be it Panthers and and whatever coalitions, and I really appreciate you for everything you've done for me. All right, brother. Well, it's mutual. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, brother, I appreciate you, and uh, and definitely give the best to my fam your family as well, brother. I will, brother. The same to you. You take care. All right. Power All, to all, all power to the people.